share screen. All right. So like I said, we're gonna do a, a review. So please, 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 I can't stress it enough. It's really a relaxed lecture and uh, we're doing a review. So I can't stress it enough that don't let anything pass today, whether you studied or not. And actually I'm gonna include the review. I'm gonna start the review from even part one. So I'm sure that you, <laughs> it was really a long time since you did anything related to part one after the, because it's, it's done before the midterm. Very understandable that uh, you forgot this stuff. <clears throat> Very understandable that you have questions that you may deem naive and they are not. And if you remember part one, we really started with two main equations. Part one was quite simple, just looking at the lift of the airplane and how it changes with the operating condition. So this was CL naught plus CL alpha times alpha plus CL delta elevator times delta elevator. The same for the moment. And without writing now, I'm writing sloppily because you guys are, are experts. I don't need to be very meticulous with you. Of course, if I want, I have to specify CG and we already know that everything is about the CG. So this is CM naught plus CM alpha times alpha plus CM delta elevator times delta elevator, right? And I'm gonna specify, I'm gonna stress that these are simply constants, right? These six coefficients, we spent quite a bit of time deriving contributions for these constants. So they are different from one airplane to another. And for each airplane, we have a contribution coming from the wing and contribution coming from the tail, right? simply add them together. These are the two main contributions. Of course, there are other contributions coming from other parts of the airplane, particularly if it's an unconventional configuration. So we have a canard or we have a new surface or something. But in general, the two main contributions coming from wing and tail, we derived expressions for them and we should be experts in determining these six numbers for a given airplane geometry. Okay, we got this then these are constants, nearly constants. What are the variables? What do you mean by variables? I mean those that change with the flight condition. Well, it's now the delta elevator, the angle of attack, right? If you change any of this, will change the flight condition. If you change the angle of attack, will immediately change the speed, right? Because it's always, it's always a balance between speed and angle of attack to generate enough lift equal to the weight. So change angle of attack, change elevator, this will immediately change the lift and the moment, right? So these are the four variables in these two equations. Okay, we, we fine, we got these numbers. What do we do with them? So uh, first of all, the first thing is to do balance, right? M all forces equal zero, which means that the lift equal the weight equal one half rho V squared area times CL. And because this is not any CL, it's CL at balance or trim, we call it CL trim. So if you solve this equation, if I, if I wanna do balance or trim for a particular airplane, I have the weight, particular altitude. So I know the density of the air at that altitude at a particular speed, I want to fly at this altitude, at this speed, so I know V, and again, the airplane is given, so I know S. So from this equation, you can get CL trim, the required lift coefficient for trim, okay? Very common problem in 158 airplane performance. So I have this value now, CL trim. I have the left-hand side, and also the left-hand side for the bottom equation. As you guys know, the CM value for trim is how much? Zero. Very good. So I know the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we have six numbers and just two variables. So I solve this equation into the two variables. I get alpha necessary for trim and more importantly, the delta elevator for trim. Why I'm saying more importantly, because this is 
the value of the elevator deflection that your servo motor will give through the autopilot command. Or the, this is the value of the elevator deflection that the pilot will need to apply through his or her stick. Okay. Any question about that? So this is the balance problem. Please, if you have any question, uh, you know, we have so it's been a quite of time we, since we discussed this. It's natural to have questions, guys. Once we ensure balance, equilibrium, or trim, then what do we do? So but what, what does balance mean? Balance means that if I start right there at this operating point, I will remain there indefinitely. So if I start at cruise condition and my lift is equal to the weight, thrust equal drag and moment equal zero, I will remain there indefinitely. I balanced all forces and moments, but I mean, there are gonna be always disturbance from your operating point. So then comes the next concept, which is independent from that concept. So usually people mix them together. What is the next concept is stability. So now we're gonna talk about stability. So you ensured balance, fine, but there are gonna be always disturbance that disturbs this balance. So we need to study the stability of this balance. And we actually um, discussed this, if you guys remember, what things ensure stability for the, for the pitching curve. Anybody remembers what is, the, what is the condition for stability in pitching direction? The only take home message out of this class, what's CM, that? CM alpha is negative. Very good. CM alpha must be negative for pitch stability. And two lectures ago, we learned something more deep about CM alpha. If anybody remembers, CM alpha is really my spring in the pitching direction. And for stability, I need to have a spring action. This is my spring action. What provides this spring action or this stabilizing action for you? What part of the airplane? Anybody remembers? Horizontal tail. Horizontal tail, very good. And we really had a couple of problems in this class to design or size the area of the horizontal tail, S tail, to ensure enough CM alpha, okay? Very good. What about the other axes? What about the rolling moment, for example, or the, yeah, let's, let's talk about the rolling moment or the yawing moment. Anybody remembers the, what was, the um, the stability requirement C in the beta and it must be zero. Okay, what what does provide you C in the beta? Anyone remembers? Uh, vertical tail, rudder. Ver vertical tail, exactly. Just stability only vertical tail. The rudder is is useless because by definition, this is a very good point. By definition, when we say stability, we really mean that without the interference of the pilot or the autopilot, so without the application of any control surface deflection, the airplane should come back to its equilibrium and its balance naturally without any interference. Okay, so the vertical tail really, just by the mere fact that there is a vertical tail sitting there, the airplane will come back from a yaw disturbance or a side slip disturbance, okay? Very good. If you remember last time, we really learned that this is, uh, I mean, we can, let's continue. If we say CL beta, this is again, must be negative for stability around the rolling motion, because we're talking about L rolling moment. And what was the main factor providing that? Uh, wing dihedral. Exactly, dihedral, very good. Dihedral. And we really, the, the symbol, its symbol is gamma. We really had a problem in class. We derived the expression. We had a problem in homework to design your dihedral to get enough CL beta. And I'm also recalling that we have other effects like the sweep, right? Although we did not discuss it quantitatively in this class, but we discussed it qualitatively. The sweep angle also, any sweep back gives you dihedral, it gives you, I'm sorry, CL beta effect, rural stability. 
and also the location of the wing. If you have a high wing on the fuselage, it gives you C elevator more negative. And remember that only due to flexibility, that also due to flexibility, natural flexibility, you're getting natural dihedral, even if you design your wing with zero dihedral. Okay, we're well, just doing review. Uh, I'm, I'm reminding you that this is the pitch stiffness. Stiffness meaning spring. Stiffness, right? This is the yaw stiffness or weathercock stiffness, weathercock stability. This is roll stiffness, right? Very good. So I ensure the balance. Like if I want to do cruise at some speed, okay, here you go. Here is how you do cruise at some speed. Please apply this specific delta elevator and you're going to do cruise at this particular required speed. Done. But then what if I encountered any little disturbance? The airplane should come back naturally because of these things. Very good. What is next? Next is, if I want to do intentionally to deviate from this equilibrium, from this cruise, if I want to do something else, I want to make sure that I have the ability to do control, okay? So uh, balance, ensuring balance or trim, then ensure that this balance position is stable on its own. And then if I intentionally want to depart from this balance position, I should be able to do control, right? So uh, anybody remembers what, uh, what is the controller for pitching motion? What allows you to do to control the pitching motion. Elevator. Elevator. elevator, very good. And we derived an expression for CM delta elevator. This is our elevator control power. How much pitching moment M you get out of a one degree elevator, right? And um, we even learned how to size, how to size sizing your elevator. Anybody remembers how? What is the condition that dictates? Uh, this is how much elevator that we need. What is the condition that we use to size our elevator? Like the condition that is most demanding in pitching moment. Uh, landing. landing. Exactly. And, it, and landing, is it stability at landing or trim at landing? Trim. Exactly. It's trim at landing. And these are the types of questions in the final. Trim at landing. This is the condition upon which usually, typically, for most airplanes, this is the, the most demanding and this is the condition upon which we size our elevator. Okay, what other, what uh, uh, what do we use for yaw, for example? Anybody remembers? Rudder. rudder, exactly. The rudder is exactly like a boat, right? So we just deflect our rudder to the right, airplane to the right, to the left, airplane to the rift. And if you remember also, uh, what condition that we use to size for rudder if we lose our one engine. So thrust asymmetry is uh, one of the criteria, one of the common criteria. And finally, what is the controller uh, for rolling? CL, what allows us to control our rolling moment L? Ailerons. The ailerons, exactly, and we had also uh, one interesting problem about um, you know airplanes getting into the wake of other airplanes. This is uh, and the story of Rich Snyder, the president of In and Out. Here, unfortunately, our neighbor airport, uh, John Wayne, and the famous accident. All right, so uh, so now we cover the three main concepts: the balance, how to ensure balance, stability of that balance and control from that balance. Very good. Then we move to part two, actually. Um, professor? Please, Abdullah. Uh, I, I hate to interrupt, but- No, no go ahead. Um, since we're talking about thrust asymmetry, I think it was pretty interesting how, you know, over the weekend, the, the there was a 777 that had an engine failure. Yeah. So as soon as that happened, I remembered this class. I was like, <laughs> wow, this is really- Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Yeah, that, that's a nice example. Thank you, Abdullah. Yes, actually, should they should bring it next time in the, I mean, at least maybe not this quarter, but at least next quarter in the, in the class. Yeah, the good thing about this class, I mean, towards the end, we are we are towards the end, but maybe after you finish, uh, it will, will make you think a lot about airplanes. And when, when you fly, you will not fly uh, like a, as a regular passenger anymore. <laughs> So uh, then we move to part two, right? Like I said, folks, really many universities, actually the majority of places that I've been to, they start this course from this part, just part two, no part one. And uh, so they start really from part two. I, I still see a value to, to see these concepts. So this is why I, I insist to teach it. Okay, so why why do we so why we're not done anyway? Why why do we need a part two? Because simply so far we have ensured balance or stability or control individually for each degree of freedom separately from the others. Like we focused only on pitch and said, okay, to make the airplane come back upon a pitch disturbance, what do we need? Well, we need a horizontal tape. But what if there are combined disturbances in pitch roll and yaw? How do we make sure? Is the, do, just by the fact that we have these three components here, horizontal tail, vertical tail, and dihedral, each ensuring stability of its own degree of freedom. Is this sufficient to have stability for the entire system? The answer is no. And this is in general, just by the mere fact that you have a, a stiffness or spring, and damper for every single degree of freedom, it does not imply, it's not sufficient that the entire system is stable because these, these stable degrees of freedom, each one is stable on its own. They may interact with each other, resulting in an unstable behavior, okay? So uh, we need some, a more rigorous theory now to study the combined things. So we're gonna have a more global vision global view, not just for each degree of freedom individually. So global view, and this is the procedure that you apply for any system, any dynamical system that you're gonna encounter in your career. You're gonna do the same. First, equations of motion. Write down your equations of motion. If there are basic first principles like force equal mass times acceleration, please use them. If not, okay, go and try to do um, uh, to develop models using machine learning, using system identification. And luckily we can exploit the 300 years of mechanics to write down equations of motion. So when we do that, here are our equations of motion. Let's do snapshot. This is our equation of motion. And as you can see, they are, they are not fancy at all. It's simple. It's mass times acceleration equal forces. This is the forces here, Fx, Fy, Fz. Any question about the, the equations of motion? So UVW are speed, so the dots are ready to change with time, so they are accelerations, mass times accelerations equal forces. So what are these weird terms? Well, it's just because we're writing down the equations of motion, not in an inertial frame. We're writing down in the body frame, and the body frame rotates with the airplane. So we're writing down in a rotating frame. Okay, the, 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 the consequence is not that crazy, the consequence is simply to add this new term, is omega cross v term. Each one of these terms is a component of omega times a component of v. This is q times w, pitching angular velocity q about y times velocity component w about z in, in, the, in the z direction, and so on and so on. R angular velocity about z times the velocity in the y direction. Each one of these two terms is one omega times one V, okay? And if our system of axes doesn't rotate, so there is no omega, then this term will not be there. And you have just the regular equation mass times the 
derivatives of velocities, i.e. the accelerations equal forces. Any question about that? And for airplane, these forces are simply equal x, y, z coming from aerodynamics, right? An airplane. So this is now when I when I expand my forces and I write this second equality, this is really application dependent. If you're for an airplane, we're gonna have some aerodynamic loads. For a submarine, we're gonna have hydrodynamic loads. For a spacecraft, we may have some gravitational and magnetic loads and so on, so whatever, you know? So uh, here it's an airplane, so I have X, Y, Z aerodynamic loads, and still there is gravity, so I'm gonna add Mg, but wait a minute, this is we're right. You just said that we're writing in the in the body axis and the body rotates. So here the components really depend on the attitude of the body, the orientation of the body. So we don't know this a priori, like it's not trivial. Okay. Uh, so how we do that? This is where we went and did the Euler angles lecture nine to fill this gap. So Euler angles exactly filled this gap for us so that now I, I know exactly what are these components. It's negative sine theta, cosine theta, cosine phi, and I'm sorry, cosine theta, sine phi, and cosine theta, cosine phi. This term is nothing but the rotation matrix times zero, zero mg. I have a vector here in the inertial frame. It's easy, it's straight downward. And I want to translate it to the body frame. So from the old, which is inertial, to the new, the body, just multiply by the rotation matrix. Do this multiplication, you get these, these three components. So we're done. All right. Uh, so this is now the equations of motion. How many unknowns do we have here? We have UVW, PQR, and now we added phi and theta. Okay. So uh, this is the translational motion. It's a rigid body. So for, for 158, maybe uh, for 158, the airplane performance, it's just a point mass. So you just write this and there is no omegas, okay? But here it's a rigid body. So we need to account for the rotational degrees of freedom. So let's go and get the rotational degrees of freedom. It's very similar set of equations. And instead of mass, now we're talking about mass moment of inertia, eyes. And instead of translational acceleration, like dots of velocity, here we have dots of angular velocities, PQR, okay? In the right-hand side, instead of having forces, here we have moments, and that's it. Here, we don't have this problem, like splitting the forces into aerodynamics and gravity. Why we don't have this problem in the moments? Because yes, of course, the moments can be split into aerodynamics, which are these element plus moments due to gravity, but the moments due to gravity vanish because the gravity force passes through the CG. Everything is around the CG. So this is the final equation of motion for the rotational motion. And this is for the translational. If you look at the unknowns, in a typical dynamics problem, we're given the forces, so we're given the right-hand side. And the motion is unknown, so the left-hand side is unknown. So we have UVW is unknown, PQR is unknown. So six unknowns in six equations, but we just added two Euler angles. So we need equations for them, okay? We need equations for the Euler angles. The same lecture, lecture eight of the Euler angles, give you this, yes? Uh, can you clarify real quickly for the rotational degrees of freedom? Uh, we have like the QR times IC minus IY. Is that being multiplied by an actual term Y or is that supposed to be I subscript Y like how it is below? This term is exactly omega cross MV, right? Omega cross the, the linear momentum, okay? This term. Okay. This term is exactly the same. It's omega cross the angular momentum, which is I omega. 
So this is why any term here is simply one I multiplying with two omegas, any term here, okay? So then, then you're asking about what? Uh, this IY? I'm sorry, maybe I... Yeah, I, yeah, I, sorry, I sorry, just yeah. Didn't, couldn't tell if it's supposed to be a subscript or if it's actually being yeah, multiplied by... That's, oh, so, sorry about that, sorry. It's, it's, it's a subscript, it's the okay. IY. And okay. uh, yeah, it's, it's a typo in the lecture, I should, I should correct it. Yeah. No, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have now six equations of motion and six unknowns, which are the linear velocities and, and angular velocity components. But there are two additional unknowns occurred here due to these Euler angles. The additional unknowns are phi and theta, right? So I need to write down equations for them like phi dot and theta dot. And again, the Euler angle lecture, oops, let's stick to the car. The Euler angles lecture also give you these equations. I derived them in class. You did a quiz and you did a problem did a problem in the homework, probably you will find them in the final, the relation between the rate of change Euler angles and the PQR. So this is what we call what? Remember, what, what are the first six equations? They are mass times accession equal forces and the rotational analog of that. This is your dynamics, right? This is dynamics. So let's write down here, maybe this is dynamics, okay? Mass times acceleration equal forces. What about this? There are no forces here. There is no mass. There is no acceleration. It's all relations between velocities. This is what we call rigid body kinematics. This is kinematics. So how in kinematics, how the rate of change of the angle relates to the angular velocity. They should be exactly the same. Yes, and they are exactly the same if we have single degrees of freedom. Like these things, they reduce down if I have, say, only pitching motion, for example, then they reduce down to theta dot equals Q. If you have only rolling motion, then they reduce down to phi dot equals P and so on. So they become really trivial. It's, this is kinematics equation. At the end of the day, we have nine equations in nine unknowns. So this is the block. Do you have a, something for here? Yes. So this is the, the heart of any flight dynamic simulator. Um, any flight simulator, you, if, if someone magically give us the forces, then I can use these nine equations and they are differential equations. They are nonlinear. I know they are hard, but we don't solve them analytically. We simply use any numerical solver like MATLAB ODE45 to solve them for us. And I get the motion, I get UVW, the airplane velocities, PQR, angular velocities, and the Euler angles, giving me the orientation of the airplanes, okay? So this is nine by nine, the heart of any flight simulator. And we can always add equation, but this is the basic, the core. Then we need to get the forces, the aerodynamic forces, right? Any question about that? Uh, professor, when I have a question about flight simulators in general, if that's okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. So when they are manufacturing a flight simulator, let's say to simulate a seven, 747, would mm -hmm. that be like, would that only simulate the 747? Or for example, let's say I wanted to simulate a 777 with that same simulator itself, would I just have to upload a new software to change the code? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so far we have, we arrived at nine equations and nine unknowns. I just wanna give you a hint here. We, in during the course, I, I always say nine by nine, but sometimes they can be eight by eight because, because no, none of these equations, none of these equations depend on epsi. 
What is Epsi? Epsi is the heading angle of the airplane. If the airplane is heading to the north, to the east, to the south, of course, the airplane flight dynamics doesn't depend on the heading, right? This is what we call in a more professional setting, ignorable coordinate, okay? The airplane doesn't depend on the heading. It's like exactly like a car. The dynamics of the car will not depend if the car is traveling north or south or east, right? It will not depend on the heading, never. So, that, so you can decouple the heading. You can just uh, cross this equation and, and trash it and solve the eight by eight if you, if you want, okay? For completion, okay, they are nine by nine. Any question about this? Okay, we have nine by nine equations of motion, but they are nonlinear, right? So we need, remember, why do we do this? Well, because we wanna do analysis similar to what we did in part one, balance, stability, control, right? But we wanna do it in a more global vision like combining all degrees of freedom, not with each in degrees of freedom uh, individually. We wanna include all of them. Okay, fine. We included all of them into equations of motion. And the next step, we wanna do stability. Okay, how we wanna do stability in this highly nonlinear system? Um, there are a few tools, but let's see what do we get if we approximate the system by a linear system. This is the very huge typically in industry and, and even in research. It's, it's the first wise step to do. I have a nonlinear system. Okay, let's linearize it and look, look at the linear approximation of this system. Why? Because we have huge legacy of tools, analysis tools that we can exploit if my system is linear. So my system is not linear. Fine, let's approximate it with a, a linear approximation, okay? with the understanding, we had a whole lecture on linearization, if you remember, with the understanding that linearization is an approximation really, and an approximation about a point. So right now we're gonna do, this is, this is the, this, this was the logic of the lectures. Lecture, first lecture in part two, which is lecture eight, write down equations of motion. Well, there were unknowns here, so we needed the next lecture, which is lecture nine about Euler angles. So we filled this gap, fine. So the very next lecture is lecture 10 is to linearize, if you remember. So this was linearization. And if you remember, when I say linearization, it's really approximation of my system. And I cannot say linearization and stop. I have to say linearization about what? I'm sorry that many people, even in professional research settings, sometimes they become sloppy in this and say, okay, we linearized our system. About what? Because the, the point makes a whole difference, right? So linearization about what? So we did linearization because this will, will determine, if you remember, will determine your value of u naught, theta naught, phi naught, and all these kind of things, whether you have these values by how much, or some of them are zeros or so and so. Linearization on its own is, is easy because we simply do balance, so replace each variable by variable naught, right? To ensure the balance. And then we do small perturbation. Again, I did problem in class. You did one quiz and you did another one in the homework. Small perturbation, you replace each variable by variable naught plus delta variable. So the new equations become all in the deltas. The new equations, these nine equations, all become in the deltas and they become linear in the deltas. What do you mean linear in the deltas? Something like a constant times delta u, a constant times delta w, a constant times delta q, and so and so. Um, professor? Yes? Did you mean delta variable? Because you have delta variable. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Abdel. Linearization, again, about, so uh, in the class, I did linearization about uh, the cruise, and in the, in, the, in the quiz, you did linearization about the pull-up maneuver, which is still symmetric flight condition, or flying symmetrically, uh, but it was not cruise. And in the homework, you did uh, linearization about uh, steady turn. It's not symmetric flight condition, right? And it's not cruise. 
in, in so so you should be able to do linearization about whatever it doesn't it really doesn't matter it only matters in the values of the of the initial condition here and that's it but it's the same procedure same everything okay the resulting equations though they will be different all right uh, what we're going to continue with during the rest of the course is linearization about the crews. So if you have linearization about any symmetric flight condition, crews or the pull up maneuver like takeoff landing, any, any symmetric flight condition, symmetric flight condition, plus the symmetry of the airplane itself, the airplane is symmetric about the XZ plane. This makes the equations decoupled. The nine by nine are decoupled. Look at here, I cannot pick like maybe any three or four or five equations from here and solve them separately because all the equations include all the variables. So the first equation includes many variables, it includes here two, four, five, and remember, and theta, this is six. And remember X also has inside it some aerodynamic variables. So at least six variables in the first equation and the same for the second, the third. So the equations are coupled together. You have to solve them simultaneously. But when you do this, the equations become decoupled into four by four, long, what we call longitudinal, longitudinal flight dynamics or longitudinal motion. This is any motion along the XZ plane. Remember any plane, here is the XZ plane. This is X, this is Z. Any plane has two translations and one rotations. So in this plane, we have the U, W, and I have the one rotation is pitching angular velocity and the angle is theta. And in, because it's a single rotation, of course, theta dot skew. So these are my motion variables here, u, w, q, theta. And so uh, the force motion along x, the force or translation motion along z, and the pitching moment equation, these three equation, along with theta dot equal q, these are the four equations governing the four variables. This is what we call the longitudinal flight dynamics. Do I have it here? Uh, yes, here, luckily. So uh, my dots, d by dt for my variables equal, here is my flight dynamic model. Each one of these variables is indeed, should be indeed delta. But some of them, the deltas are equal to the variable itself. If we're talking about crews, what is my value for the pitching angular velocity? It's velocity, pitching angular velocity at the crews. Well, the airplane is not pitching at the cruise. So Q naught is zero. So if your Q naught is zero, then Q is simply the same as delta Q. Okay. And, and this applies to many variables. Obviously, it doesn't apply to you because your U naught, the forward speed of the airplane during cruise, is never zero, right? Okay, so but but strictly speaking, each one of these variables is really the delta. Any question about that? So the symmetry in both in the flight condition and in of the airplane itself, these symmetries, they led to decoupling of the equations. So, um, and since we did linearizations, the equation now are linear. So I have the, the dots equal something. These are constants, you can see like gravity, for example. These are constant times my variables again, and another constant time is my input. So the four standard inputs, elevator, aileron, rudder, and thrust are also decoupled. Two of them providing motion in that plane, of course, the elevator provides pitching and changes the lift, which is the Z force. The same for thrust, it changes the X force. 
So these provide motion in this plane, so they belong to the longitudinal flight dynamics. The other five, and again, you can consider them five or four by ignoring Epsi, the heading angle. We call them the lateral flight dynamics. This is anything out of the XZ plane. Like what, the side slip, roll, yaw. So, um, this is the five by five system. You can find here V, this is the side. Any, anything else left from your nine variables that is not taken into these four, you'll find it here. So the side slip V, because we had U, V, W are the components. U and W are taken here. So V is in the latter. P, Q, R, angular velocities. We have Q here. So the P and the R in the latter. Phi theta, epsi, Euler angles. I got theta here. So phi and epsi are in the latter. Okay. Any question about, about this? Um, professor, it's not really uh, on on this specifically, but I'm I'm curious with these linear linearizations, how close or how far do you have to deviate before it's no longer valid to to linearize these equations? That's a very good question, Sam, and it's it's not easy to answer. It really depends from one airplane to another. There is no universal answer to this question. But let me give you, um, let me give you so. Your question is is, is, is is a very good one, and uh, but I will I will not uh, like I will not I will say a statement that is not exactly uh, answering your question, but is is a bit related. Okay. Because uh, sometimes sometimes people say, I mean, all what you un what you study in your undergrad is linear systems. You barely hear anything about nonlinear systems. And also we spend quite a bit of time even in graduate school learning about linear systems. And, and there is, this is a usual question that we always get and, and we used to question ourselves. Why do we spend all this time, you know, studying linear systems, whereas world is really nonlinear, right? This is a usual ubiquitous question. Interestingly, it's not about, uh, yeah, of course you can approximate, and, but, but it's about the following. If you prove stability for your linear linearized system, then the nonlinear system is stable over a small neighborhood. Not only stability, it's any property you like. If your linearized version is controllable, then your nonlinear system is controllable in a small neighborhood. If your linearized version is observable, then so you can uh, estimate all your motion variables from just maybe one measurement or something then your nonlinear system is also observable. If your linear system, linearized system is detectable, then the nonlinear system is detectable. If your linear system is stabilizable, then the nonlinear system is stabilizable and so on. So, so you're, you got to analyze a simpler system, which is the linearized, and you got to conclude the property to your uh, harder system, which is the nonlinear. So this is on the utility of the linear systems. Uh, back to your question, this has to do with something called a region of attraction. So any nonlinear system, when you have an, an equilibrium, have a balance, like the cruise condition for the airplane, if it's stable, okay. Uh, even, even if you're analyzing the full nonlinear system, okay. If it's stable, then it's stable um, to against how much disturbance. Is it globally stable? No matter how much disturbance you get, it will be stable well. It's rarely the case, of course not. So most systems has something called region of attraction. So uh, which determines exactly what you're asking for, for how much disturbance I can apply and my system still remains stable. And okay. uh, the determination of region, so, so this is that something that you can uh, go and read about if you wanna get more detailed, a region of attraction. Okay, so there's a method to determine Yes. How similar they are for each given set of equations. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, and it's Thank not you. it's not trivial. Yeah, you're welcome. Sam. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we got our systems. We got to the point. This is great point. Why? Because this is exactly the form we like. What is this form? These are my motion variables. So these are my state variables. I got them in the following form. My x dot is 
some matrix A times my motion variables X again, plus some matrix B times my control inputs. We, we gonna denote them utility. And the same for the lateral. My X dot is a matrix A times X, plus a matrix B times my control input U, right? This is a great form, why? Because like I said, we have huge legacy. Tell me what you want. I mean, to me, frankly speaking, this form is the paradise for a control engineer. Tell me what you want. You want stability? Fine. It's just the eigenvalues of the A matrix. You want to design a feedback controller? I can design a feedback controller for you that ensures that places all the poles at arbitrary locations. And we learned it last time that the poles locations really determine your performance, right? Settling time and overshoot and everything. Tell me what you want. You want to design an optimal controller? Here it is. So this is the, really, we have a huge legacy uh, based on this form. So we luckily managed to put our system in this form. And again, these guys, these steps, you're gonna follow no matter what, what system you're, you're dealing with. Write down equations of motion. If you need Euler angles, fine. If not, it's okay. Then do linearization. You have your state space model. If it's a simpler system, you can, uh, you know, you can use your classical control tools, transfer function kind of thing. All right, as you see, once we did linearization, these amatrices, they're gonna tell how good or bad our airplane. And they are full of punch of variables pop up into our faces when we did this linearization. These things like MQ, MW, M alpha, you know, all these, all these things like NP, LP, NR, LR, punch of things pop into our faces. These are what we call stability derivatives, right? They are really, they are really aerodynamic derivatives. They are called stability derivatives because they play a decisive role in determining the stability of the airplane. So stability derivatives, these are the MQ, LP, LR, NP, NR, and so on. So I derived three of them in class, you did in quiz, and you, you had a couple of problems that you're doing now, I guess. Uh, actually, you turn it on, right? You know, we're having another homework. So um, stability derivatives are very important. And of course, I'm gonna ask about them in the final, about to derive something. Uh, and um, just to give you an idea. So when you go to industry and or you're, you know, even, even if you're doing DBF kind of activities, you're designing your airplane, I, I will not go and derive, I will not derive them the way we did in class, frankly speaking. I will go and use any of the softwares like AVL, for example, okay? Fine. And I encourage you to do that. That's fine. But please don't, don't completely ignore uh, this knowledge that we gained here. Why? Because when you go into industry and uh, you have a, a new configuration, unconventional configuration coming, then the existing software will not be able to tell you the stability derivatives of, of this new configuration. You have to come here and, you know, uh, remove the, the dust from your notes, class notes, and really do it exactly the same way we did in this class. And just to show you an example, uh, you, you, some of you guys know that we are working with uh, micro air vehicles that fly like insects. Of course, there are no, none of the existing software like the AVL and others can give you stability derivatives for this new configuration. And uh, here are a couple of papers. This is by other colleagues in Purdue in uh, one of the prestigious journals, IEEE Transactions and Robotics. This is 2011, so it's relative, relatively recent. If you go down, it's really talking about, uh, let's go, yeah, so here. No, let me go up. Very good, yes. Yeah, here, look at this. It's X, U, Z, U, L, P, the roll damping that we have in our class. M, Q, pitch damping. N, R, the yaw damping. 
they simply, the whole of this paper, this is like the state of the art research, right? One of the prestigious journals. They are deriving these stability derivatives for a new configuration using ex exactly the same tools that we had in class. I, in fact, can assign one of these derivations in the class and look at the, our equations of motions exactly the same. And this is another paper by uh, myself and our you know, group. And again, it's Journal Guidance Control and Dynamics, one of the most prestigious journals in, in airplane flight mechanics. And uh, this is 2014, it's a more recent one. And again, we're really deriving down stability derivatives. Here are the stability derivatives, exactly the same way we did in class here. So whenever you have a an unconventional configuration, you're gonna come back to the basics, no way. If not, good luck, of course, with the uh, existing software, okay? Questions? Um, professor, so I had just to double check. So this, uh, these matrix equations that we've came up with so far, they're only valid for symmetric flight conditions, right? That was the- Very good, yes. Thank you, Ethan. This is not even any symmetric. This is for the cruise. If not, if not the cruise, okay, well, you know the procedure. Go and do your linearization, please. Actually, you already did one. Uh, you already did one in homework, right? About the turning, for example, right? But, but you only did one of the equations, which is the pitching moment equation. Okay, please do all of them. Then you will find uh, the linearized version about whatever flight condition you like. For this class, we'll continue with the cruise. Okay. So this is around the cruise. I have U naught. And uh, uh, what I'm saying here is that if you did about any symmetric flight condition, not necessarily cruise, you will have the decoupling. But if you do about turn, for example, you will not necessarily have the same decoupling. Okay. Okay. So that's why uh, Better your elevator uh, uh, with your your trim. Um, sorry, I did not hear this. Oh, okay. just so like for the delta U, the U not just whatever we want during. Oh the yeah, yeah. You notice is the cruise speed of the airplane. Right, and the elevator delta elevator elevator not. Exactly, delta elevator not is the one that we got from very early on. This is the delta elevator necessary for balance and trim. This is delta elevator naught in our new language now, okay? All right, so uh, so in the last in the last couple of lectures or actually lecture 11, I guess, in particular, we learned how to derive expressions for our stability derivatives in terms of the geometry from vertical tail, wing, wing horizontal tail, and so on. So, so now we should be able to get these as numbers. Uh, you need to know how to derive, okay? But uh, if I want you to do anything with the A matrix, of course, I'll give you the numbers uh, directly. So I have my A matrix now and B matrix as numbers. So now let's go and do analysis. So we need to do linear systems, analysis of linear systems. We spent the last lecture, the entire last lecture, reviewing some of the concepts, right? If I have a linear system, I can represent it by a transfer function or a state space model. Okay, if you, if you represent it by a state space model like this, how do you study stability? Well, check the eigenvalues. And uh, if I don't like the performance, we can do feedback control, state feedback to do pole placement, right? U equals negative K um, gains times X. Okay, and how we design the gains, we learned that. So uh, today we're gonna continue with this review and I need some very important concepts from uh, vibration. So let me stop here and I will, uh, all right. And I will use this presentation. Any questions guys? Cause this will, you know, we will, uh, We'll go to, you can say totally new thing. It's it's actually review. And and this will not be in the exam, the, the vibration concepts specifically will not be in the exam, but they, are, they will be very essential for you to understand 
uh, next lecture, the next two lectures. And the next two lectures will be essential for the final exam. It's a nice review anyway, whether you have taken vibrations or not. You, you guys know I, I, I love, uh, I mean, it's actually everything in life boils down to my spring system, right? So let's study this deeply. Mass spring damper system. And please stop me if you have any questions. Okay, you guys know the concept of natural frequency, which is simply square root K over M. And as you can see, K here is just the value of the spring. M is the value of the mass. So these have nothing to do with the applied force. So this is why the natural frequency is a characteristic of the system, has nothing to do with the input or the forces. It's natural, this is what's called natural. And uh, all right, we, as you guys know, we usually have two types of response, something what we call natural response, which is you just push it at the, at the beginning and leave it to respond on its own. So this is like a natural response. Like we stretch the spring at the beginning and leave it, okay? Versus I have a, a persistent force keep pushing and pulling. So I'm, 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 I'm holding the mass and keep pushing and pulling. I'm applying a persistent force, whether it's a constant force, constant value, pushing all the way with a constant value, or the force itself varies, push and pull like here, cosine omega t, okay? Please stop me if you have any questions. Okay, let's review together what, how the system will respond to either disturbance. If the natural, I stretch my spring uh, one centimeter and leave it, what will happen? Assume that there is no damping for the moment. What will happen? It keeps oscillating back and forth, right? Fine. At what speed? Like, will it oscillate too fast or will it oscillate slowly? In fact, will it oscillate exactly at this natural frequency? Okay. So this is a quite important quantity. And I will apply the, I will upload these slides. Don't worry, folks. All right. Uh, any question about that? Okay. And uh, whereas now here, if I apply, if I apply a force, so I'm holding this mass and I'm pushing and pulling. Well, uh, also the 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 spring and the mass and the entire system will go back and forth. How fast? Logically, it will follow my speed. So if I'm forcing at this omega, this speed, the response, the oscillation will be at the same forcing frequency, at the same omega, okay? If you do it fast, it will be fast. If you do it slowly, it will be slow. Very good. So this is how fast. What about how much? Like between say 10 centimeter, negative 10 centimeter, five, negative five, how much? How much, so uh, for the natural response, if I stretch the spring, again, I assume no damping, stretch the spring one centimeter and leave it. It will go back and forth. Between how much and how much? Actually, between one and negative one. Exactly the same value applied at the beginning. So the amplitude of oscillation depends on the initial condition. It's determined by initial conditions, okay? And how fast is simply at your natural frequency. Any question about that? Um, professor? Abdullah? Obviously, we're assuming there's no friction, right? Yeah, it damping, damping, forever. damping, representing friction. What, what, okay. what does friction uh, provide? It doesn't actually change these things significantly. It actually uh, makes the motion dies out after a while, right? So, what about here? What about the amplitude of oscillation? How much is it? Like here, there is no initial condition, right? Here is you're giving, you're pushing back and forth. So obviously, if you push harder, like larger force, you will get larger amplitude. Yeah, that's intuitive. But is there anything else non-intuitive? Yes, actually, the amplitude of oscillation does not depend only on your amplitude of forcing, but also on how fast. It's not how much, not only how much, but how fast. Like if you apply the same force, but faster will be different if you apply it slowly. So let's see. So if, if this is my force and I'm applying, this is how much I'm pushing, right? And this is omega is how fast. Please stop me if you have any questions. 
Okay, mass spring is everywhere. Every system, no matter how complete, at the end of the day, you will see our airplane is really just mass spring. Okay, um, so this is how much and this is how fast. My response to that, this is how much I'm oscillating and this is how fast. And you can see immediately, of course, uh, it's the same speed, right? We, we agreed to that. Okay, now how much? We also agree that uh, this X will increase if I increase my force. So it's natural to normalize by, to divide by. And after some derivation, you don't require to know it at all. I mean, of course you have seen it before. You can see that this normalized, this how much oscillation you get, per how much you, you apply. Look at this, depends on what? Depends on omega. Depends on how fast you apply your forces. And this is this usual diagram that is very famous. This is your X bar. If you're applying a constant force, like steady, constant, I'm not oscillating. So I'm, get, I'm getting this guy also not oscillating. It's omega zero. So uh, how much is this? Well, uh, the ratio will be simply one. I'm getting what I'm applying. Okay, but once you start to oscillate, so this guy will oscillate also. Now, the amplitude X now will depend on how fast. If you oscillate exactly at the natural frequency, your omega N is equal to, your omega is equal to omega N, you will get the maximum response. If it's zero damping, it will go to infinity, theoretically. If you have slight damping, still it will not go to infinity, but it will just give very large response. So if you're applying a force at the natural frequency, you'll get the larger, the largest amplitude. Okay. Before the natural frequency is small, after is also small. So let's see a, a, a video for that. This is a mass and there is a spring down, it will be shown now. And here we're oscillating below the natural frequency, we're oscillating slowly. So we're getting a slow response as you see, this is the spring. So there is a mass at the top and there is a spring and it's a slow oscillation. Now we're gonna do add the natural frequency of the system, 1.5 Hertz. Let's see what happens. So now we're applying a force at the natural frequency. Let's see what happens. The amplitude is increasing, 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 and it will keep increasing until it reaches the very large amplitudes. And as you know, if damping is small, it will be very large amplitude. So the amplitude is still increases and actually it will be it will lead to a failure. If you have small damping and you have you apply force at the natural frequency, uh, your system will blow up. Whereas if you apply now a force a little bit above the natural frequency, a little bit above. The system behavior is nice and the amplitude is small. So I want you to have in the back of your mind that the, the amplitude, what you get, depends on how fast the force, the applied force, okay? This is important. It's not depending on how much. It depends on how much, of course, but also on how fast, okay? This is a very important concept. All right, about single mass spring. There is a very important concept. I actually like to add it here. Let's see. I will add it here because we will need it. I will add it here. Uh, if you have a spring and you oscillate it between these two positions, so I stretch my spring. My spring goes back and forth, okay? So the mass is here and the mass goes here. At this position, the speed is how much? Do you know at this position? The V is how much? Can you tell me? This is the maximum position. Zero. Zero. So the kinetic energy is zero. And the deflection is maximum. So the potential energy is maximum, right? At this medium position, though, 
there is no deflection, so the potential energy is zero, but the speed is maximum, right? Which means that the kinetic energy is maximum. This is really, do you see this exchange or interchange between kinetic energy and potential energy that we see every day in life? We will see it exactly in, in, in our airplanes next, next lecture. Okay, please remember this. And again, it, it can be really demonstrated on a simple mass spread system. All right, let's go back to our slide. And now we're going to two masses, right? Yes, here is the two masses. Two masses, nothing fancy. Mass, uh, write down equations of motion, the very first step, right? Mass times acceleration equal forces for each mass. Collect them in a matrix form. So look at this equation. It's actually nothing but mass times x or mx double dot equals negative kx. It's the equation for a spring. But my mass now is a matrix, not a single mass, because I have two masses actually. And my stiffness k is also a matrix. Okay, fine. Let's get the natural frequency. How we get the natural frequency? For a single mass spring, it was the square root k over m. Now k and m are matrices. So in the matrix language, how we divide k by m? Well, it's actually m inverse k, right? So get the eigenvalues of these guys. These are your omega n squared. So now if, if, if k is two by two, m is two by two, so m inverse k is two by two. If you have two by two matrix, of course you have two eigenvalues. So the natural frequent, now we have frequencies. It's not only one, I have two. So if I do this for this system, I get two values. One that is 0.7 and one that is 1.8. Smaller frequency and a larger frequency. These are the natural frequencies, okay? All right, so I have the natural frequencies. Uh, again, we're gonna ask the, 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 the same questions. What will happen if you just stretch the springs at the beginning versus if you keep oscillating, keep pushing, what will happen? So let's see here, if you just stretch at the beginning, what will happen? Back if single mass spring, I will oscillate at a particular speed determined by the natural frequency. Here I have two natural frequencies. So the signal will, will have the two frequencies, something like sine omega 1t plus sine omega 2t. And we, we will come back also to it. Here it's the same. It will follow your frequency, follow your speed. If you're pushing and pulling fast, it will be fast. If you're doing it slowly, it will be slowly. Okay, fine. What about the amplitude? So, and also, what if I excite at one of the two natural frequencies? So if I apply here, we, we know that if it's a single mass spring, if I apply at one of the, at, at the natural frequency, the system will almost blow up. For a multi-degree of freedom system, more than one mass, this is exactly our airplane, right? Multi-degree of freedom system. What will happen if you excite at one of the two natural frequencies here? What will happen? This will actually lead us to the concept of, I mean, we got the eigenvalues, right? Which is eigenvalues here are what? Eigenvalues, again, eigenvalues of a matrix is a quite mathy concept, but here in vibrations is very, has a very physical meaning. What's this physical meaning? They are actually your natural frequencies, your speeds of response. Okay, again, also the, the, the eigenvector in general is a mathy concept, but here it has um, very physical meaning. Let's see this because this is quite interesting. Again, my equation of motion, mass times acceleration equal forces, and I got the eigenvalues. How we get the eigenvalue of M inverse K? Let's call it a matrix A. The eigenvalues of any matrix A is lambda I minus A determinant equals zero and solve for the lambdas. Fine, we got them. Then how do we get the eigenvectors of A? Here are we get the eigenvectors. You get your lambda I minus A again, which you just used here. And you multiply by the vector, the eigenvector X, which is the unknown, we're gonna solve for it. And now for each eigenvalue, there is a corresponding eigenvector. Substitute here by lambda one, you get the first vector. Substitute by lambda two, you get the second vector. And this problem is actually uh, the definition of an eigen, 
value problem. Look, 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 at, look at this, please. I have a matrix times a vector equals zero. What is the solution of this equation? So I have a matrix known, A is known, and X is unknown, equals zero. What's the solution? Well, the solution divide by this A or multiply by A inverse, the solution is X equals zero. Right, but there are only few values for lambda where we have a non-zero solution. These values are the eigenvalues and the corresponding non-zero solutions are the eigenvectors, okay? So when you substitute here by the eigenvalues, I can have a non-zero solution for x's and this non-zero solution will be the eigenvector. Okay, let's substitute by lambda one here. So I have two equations in two unknowns, x1 and x2. Always the case, one of these equations is redundant. So cross any of these two equations, you have the remaining equation. Here is the remaining equation. It's a, it's a one equation in two unknowns. Assume any of the value, any of the x's and get the other. When I do that, I assume x2 is one, I get the, I solve for the first, okay? So this is why in the eigenvector, what we call the mode shape, this is the mode shape. The eigenvector is the mode shape. This is why for the eigenvector, the mode shape, the, the exact values don't matter. What really matters is the ratio because I could assume, I could have assumed X2, not one, but two. Then this guy would be 0.828, right? So what really matters is the ratio. Any questions so far? So I got the first eigenvector of the mode shape. Let's summarize here. Let's do it with, with the second. I got the second eigenvector, second mode shape. So let's summarize. I have two masses. So my mass matrix is two by two. My stiffness matrix is two by two. I get the M inverse K and get the eigenvalues. I have my two natural frequencies, 0.77 and 1.85. For each natural frequency or eigenvalue, there is an eigenvector. Fine, so far, these are mathy things. How do we interpret them? This is quite interesting, look at this. Actually, the eigenvector, the mode shape, tells you a lot about the motion. If you excite the system at this mode, if you apply a force that is as fast as this value, oscillates as this value, this will be the motion. What do you mean? We mean that the two masses will move to get together because they, are ha they have the same sign, positive and positive. Not only that, so they, they will go to the right together, go to the left together. Not only that, they will move such that always at each instant in time, the first mass is 41% displacement of the second mass. Let's interpret the second mode. If I excite my system faster, this was 0 0.77, this is 1.85. If I excite it faster, close to this value, what will happen? This will be the motion. How do we interpret? The first mass is always moving opposite to the second mass. And the second mass is always moving 41% of the first mass. It's quite interesting. It tells us almost everything about the motion. Okay, this is, this is uh, always shown in the frequency response. So now we have two figures, not only one figure. One for X1 in blue, one for X2 in red. This is the first two at, at the smaller omega, the slower omega. The two masses, the first mass moves less at the faster omega is the other way around. And let's see, um, let's see, uh, um, this is a simulation that I did, simulation in MATLAB. I'm applying a force at this omega. So what happens, first of all, the response is slow following this omega. And what happens at any particular instant in time, look at that. The two peaks are together in the same direction. If one is positive, the other one is also positive. And the first mass is 41% of the second mass. What if you apply the exact same force, but at a higher frequency? First of all, the response is higher, is, is faster. It's the same time. Look at this. This is about 40 seconds. This is also about 40 seconds. Here were few cycles. Here are much more or many more cycles. So it's faster. And at this faster frequency, what happened naturally is that the two masses are always opposite to each other. Not only that, 
The second mass is about 40% of the first mass, moves less. And how do we get this? We get all of this just by these two numbers in the eigenvector or the mode shape. Let's have this video. So this is mass one for us, this is mass two. Here we're exciting at the slower frequency. Here was the mode shape. Look at that, they, they both move slowly. Second, they move together. Third, as you can see, the first mass moves less, about 41% of the second mass. What happened if we do it the other way around? Look at this here. Now we're exciting at higher frequency. First of all, the system is moving faster. Second, as you can see, the two masses are moving opposite each other. Third, the first, ma the, the, the second mass is moving less. The second mass is about 40% of the first mass. Any question about that? So we learn it, if I ask you now on, how to excite a particular mode? If you go into an interview, how to excite a particular, because next time, next lecture, next lecture, we will talk about the modes of an airplane in flight, okay? How to excite a particular mode for any given system? How to excite? Apply a force at the natural frequency of that mode, right? So this is a way to excite a mode by forcing. Can you excite it by a natural response, like giving just an initial disturbance? Can you excite a mode by initial disturbance? So I know how to excite this mode by forcing, just up, make your force vary as fast as this value, right? And the same here. What if I just want to give an initial condition? I, how can you accept a particular mode? Give initial conditions that resemble your mode shape. So stretch your second mass one centimeter to the right and your first mass 0.4 centimeter also to the right. Just do this stretch, leave it. What will happen? The system will naturally oscillate at this exact frequency with this mode shape, okay? So it's quite interesting when you do it in the lab because now if you just uh, stretch the first mass one centimeter to the right and the second mass 0.4 centimeter to the left, just stretch this and leave it, what will happen? The system will naturally oscillate faster, will naturally oscillate faster with this mode shape. It's quite interesting. Any question about that? Professor? I'm having a little bit of difficulty and I didn't take vibration, so I'm sure I'm one of the, the that's fine. minority here, but mm -hmm. the multiple masses and multiple degrees of freedom, for instance, an airplane, which is sort of a single rigid body, well, sort of, but how, how, does, how do you make that connection between having two separate masses connected by a spring versus something that can move in multiple dimensions? Uh, so this is a very good question and we will have a whole lecture for it next time. Actually, okay. actually two lectures, one for the longitudinal modes, one for the lateral modes. And the first, the coming two lectures are quite strong, but, but we, we will need exactly this knowledge to apply it there. We will need, what do we mean by a mode shape? What do we mean by a natural frequency? And how do we excite a mode by applying a force or by applying a, uh, an initial condition that resembles the mode? This is what we're gonna need. Okay, I'll, I'll just yeah. wait for that then, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so here is, I mean, let's conclude with this example. Again, it's three masses, nothing fancy. Write down your equations of motion, please. Collect them in a matrix form. It's the exact same form, which is mx double dot equals negative kx. But as you guys know, m and k now are matrices. Your natural frequency is given by the exact same formula. And this IG is actually uh, a MATLAB command, as you guys know. Just type IG M inverse K, you get the eigenvalues. The square root of the eigenvalues are the natural frequencies. Fine, so we got here because it's three masses, a three by three system, we have three values 0.4, 1.4, and 2.18. Okay, so associated with each natural frequency, there is a mode shape or eigenvector. So uh, let's go and do this. Here are the eigenvectors. So how do we interpret? This is the important point. How do we interpret the mode shape? If I apply a force 
at this frequency, this fast. So slowly, this is the slowest, right? What will happen? The three masses will move together. The first mass will move half of the third. The second mass will move almost as equal to the third, 95%. What if I apply it faster? What will happen? Well, the first mass will move opposite to the third mass and the third mass will, will move half of the first. And actually, interestingly, the second mass will remain motionless, okay? So this is quite interesting. If I apply forcing at this frequency, the second mass will not feel it, okay? And, and the third, the third, I mean, it's, it's now you guys should be expert on this. And if you apply real force at this frequency, the first and third mass will move in the same direction, uh, which opposite to the second mass. And um, this is the frequency response. Here we have three curves. X1 is blue, X2 is red, and X3 is yellow. And as you can see, the first mode here at the slowest omega, X1 is half of the yellow, the X3, and X2 is almost as equal as 95% or something. Uh, for the second mode here at the second omega, the intermediate omega, X2 is quite weak, is almost zero, and X3 is almost half of X1, and so on, so. So here is, uh, again, I can force a mode, I can excite a mode, we call it an excite a mode, by applying a forcing at that frequency. But how do you excite, how can I excite this mode uh, without forcing, just by initial conditions? Please apply initial conditions that resemble this. Stretch the first mass one centimeter to the right, the third mass 0.5 centimeter to the left, and don't stretch the second mass in your initial conditions. Just leave it, what will happen? The system will oscillate at this frequency by this mode shape. This is a MATLAB simulation of this thing. I give this initial condition and let the system respond. And here is the response. As you can see, X2 is the red, is actually remains motionless, zero all the time. X1 in blue is always opposite to the yellow. And the ratio is half all of the time. Okay. We're done with today. Uh, I usually say in, in most of the lectures, uh, if you didn't study anything from before, you, that's fine, you can start fresh. The next two lectures will not work like this. This lecture, the concept of vibrations are necessary to understand the next two lectures. So please review at least this uh, last 20 minutes about the vibrations uh, for next coming two lectures. Questions? Uh, Professor, could you hop back one slide to the last one? Of course. Um, in this in this case, the the third frequency mm. on the plot, the the middle x two does not go up to one. It stays. Uh, low. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 so that, this is a very good question, Sam. Thank you. But so uh, the, these ratios are with respect to each other, not with respect to these ones. So let's see. So what is the ratio here? So let's see X of three, here is 0.7 of, of X two. So the yellow should be 0.7 of the, of the red. If you divide these two peaks with respect to each other, they will be really 0.7 and the blue will be 0.3. Um, but together, the amplitude as a whole will be smaller than the amplitude of the second frequency and the amplitude of the first frequency. Okay. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank good, you. Very, very good question. Yeah. Um, professor? <laughs> okay, Jeremy. Yep. So, yes. I had a, so like, when we're talking about, like, uh, these applied frequencies, like, we're, we're, we're implying that we're forcing our system, like, at a, like, a sinusoidal force. I was just wondering, like, during flight, what are some sources of what would be the sources of it? Uh, like I said, it's, it's, it may be a central force, but maybe also an initial disturbance, right? So this is why I'm stressing the initial disturbance point of it. I see. So okay. if, you, if you fly it, I mean, it would be interesting the next two lectures, we will we'll identify what are these modes look like? Because like Sam was asking, I mean, we don't have like several masses and springs and, 
how this will boil down and show up in an airplane flight mechanics. And frankly speaking, it's not in all the books. It's it's uh, uh, to, to to bring this connection of, of of more shapes to the airplane flight mechanics. But we'll see. We'll see next time how an initial disturbance that resembles a mode shape or a eigen vector can excite a particular mode. And what are these modes to begin with? Okay. And then not to go like soon, because I mean, it's for next lecture, but so when we learn about like these, I guess like about the initial conditions that could lead to like uh, these bad scenarios, will this put restrictions on like the maneuvers that we can make? Like, will it tell us something like, don't- uh, No, we, we actually, you know, we will, usually we do it the other way around in the sense we make sure that um, these modes are nicely behaving. So we're gonna design flight control systems such that these modes are nicely behaving. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, uh, Liam, the, the x-axis, I'm sorry about that, the x-axis is frequency. This is the frequency response. So these three peaks correspond to the three natural frequencies. Uh, this, the, the value of the frequencies are around 0.45, like this one. The second frequency is 1.4, like this one. And the third here is 2.18, like this one. Yeah. This is the time, I think, where is, I'm sorry. This is the time, simulation. So th this is the interesting thing, is that just by the eigen uh, vector or the mode shape, I can deduce or I can expect and predict how the motion in time will look like, okay? Any questions? Uh, if nobody has any questions, I have kind of a general controls question. Please, Jeremy. Um, so I was wondering as far as, cause you know, I'm planning on attending grad school. Uh, like what is the major difference in usage between linear and optimal control and adaptive systems and dynamic modeling? That's a good question. So, uh, okay, optimal control has to do with optimization. You wanna, you wanna, okay, say uh, a typical example related to our course. I want to go from um, say altitude zero at the runway to an altitude, the cruise altitude in minimum time. If, a, if I'm an interceptor airplane, I wanna intercept fighting, fighter airplanes coming to attack. Or wanna do it in minimum fuel, uh, because I'm a commercial airplane, okay? So this is an optimal control, pro typical optimal control problem. Uh, nothing has been said now about, um, uh, I mean, we, we, we do that, the typical optimal control problem, we do that by knowing, by having a good knowledge about the system, about the system dynamics, system model. We have a model and we, we believe it. Then the adaptive control, that you asked about, it's, it's slightly different in the sense, first of all, we're not necessarily optimizing, but the main objective is we actually know very little about the system dynamics. Like the A and B matrices, we know very little. Maybe we don't know anything about the A matrix and we know very little about the B matrix, okay? So you don't know your system and you wanna do an adaptive controller, so you, it says, it's almost as if you're, you're learning your system online and adapting your control. So for a given A and B, I can give you the gains offline. But if I don't know the A and B, I'm gonna learn them. I'm just trying to make it simple, okay? So I'm gonna learn them online and my, adapt my gains online until I get the right response. So it's just vaguely uh, the difference. Of course, there are deeper differences. So uh, just to make sure I'm getting the adaptive, it's basically with the adaptive, you don't have a set model. So you try and design it. So your sensors can build the model as you go. If, exactly. Yeah. I don't, my, my, I don't know my A matrix and uh, I don't know my B matrix. I just know maybe the signs like, uh, you know, if you move your elevator down, the airplane will be down. This is, but how much CM Delta elevator? I know it's negative, but I don't know how much. Okay, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. Questions? All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Professor, really quick, just one. Yeah, please, Ethan.
So for the natural frequency, you said that um, this holds when we're assuming that the damping coefficient is zero, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Again, damping will, what, 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 what's the effect of the damping here is that these peaks will not, will not, will not continue constant like this, will actually decrease until they die out after some time. Okay. But, but the oscillation until they die, the oscillation will happen at the natural frequency and all the concepts that we, and they will die by the same ratio. So the still the ratios between the different degrees of freedom will go with the mode shape. So everything will go the same, except that it will not remain indefinitely. It will die after a while. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome, Ethan. Professor? Yes? Is there a difference between when you say symmetric flight condition and symmetry about the XZ? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a very good question, Colton. So the symmetry about the XZ plane, this is a characteristic of the airplane, irrespective of the flight condition. I mean, the, the existing airplanes that we build, they tend out to be symmetric already due to design about the XZ plane, fine. But now uh, this airplane with this symmetry, it can have an asymmetric flight condition, like the turning, for example, right? And if you do linearization about turning, you will not get that coupling that we talked about, actually. So this coupling is due to two things, not only one thing. is symmetry of the airplane and symmetry of the flight condition, both simultaneously. So can you explain again what you mean by symmetric flight condition then? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the flight condition respects this symmetry. So you don't have any of the lateral variables in your note, note the initial thing. So the lateral variables are V, P, R, phi, Epsi, right? The, 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 the roll, yaw, and side slip. You, you don't have any of these in your not condition. In the turn, for example, you have phi, right? And you have actually uh, R, yaw rate, you, you keep turning. So this doesn't respect the symmetry in the sense your right wing is not exact does not exactly see the the condition that your left wing sees right in the turning, so you're not respecting that symmetry of the XZ plane. Any flight condition that respects the symmetry is a symmetric flight condition. Like what? Like of course cruise take off because we take off symmetrically right wing like left wing. Symmetry here we mean we we, we mean between the right wing and left wing. So take off landing, um, uh, climb, descent. OK, I think I see what you mean now. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome, Colton. All right, folks. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, so 